Hello, I hope you all are doing well. Today we're going to talk about vestibular dysfunction. Let me take a minute for my computer to catch up and show the full screen. You know, I am a certified vestibular rehab therapist and so I really enjoy um, vestibular dysfunction and treating vestibular dysfunction. I really enjoy this patient population. So hopefully I can spark an interest in you too. All right, balance centers, you know these. These are the eyes, vision, proprioception, or the input coming back from the muscles in your legs, and the inner ears. That is our vestibular system. Uh, in our inner ears, we have the semicircular canals. They are filled with fluid, and as your head moves in different directions, the fluid moves in the direction in the opposite direction um, to tell your brain where your head is in space. There are hair cells within the fluid that are displaced, they're pushed to and fro as your head moves and the input from those hair cells uh, gives a lot of the feedback about what your head is doing to your brain so that you know exactly where everything is. Some of the def Anition. So vestibular, this is a body system. It includes the inner ear and parts of the brain that control balance and they control um, eye movements. Oticonia, which is also called canalith, is uh, calcium carbonate crystals. It's like these little crystals inside of your ear that sit on this gelatinous substance. And as your head moves, it moves and displaces that gelatin it's sitting on to give your brain feedback about where your head is as well. Um, let me exit full screen because I actually have some notes at the bottom. I want to make sure I always cover those. Um, although it is called otoconium, most of the time when we're doing a repositioning maneuver, which we'll learn about later, we call it canalith, canalith repositioning. Some more definitions. Vertigo is just a sensation of spinning or dizziness. Um, it's typically associated with head movements. This is a symptom that someone describes that they have. It's not a true diagnosis. So a lot of doctors, um, especially primary practitioners, um, will just tell the patient as they explain they have dizziness, they'll just say, yeah, you have vertigo, um, which is not an actual diagnosis. That's a symptom. So really the patient needs to go to an ENT or a neurologist, someone who kind of specializes in vestibular disorders in order to get a diagnosis as to why they are dizzy. Um, but many have been told they have vertigo. You'll see in a lot of patients past medical history, it's not a true diagnosis, it's just a symptom. Nystagmus, that's jumpy eye movements. It's involuntary rapid eye movement. So if you've ever watched somebody as they look out the window as they're um, riding in a car, as their eyes look at different things along the highway, they jump to each thing. That you're moving so fast when you're driving a car that you cannot use smooth pursuit, so your eyes can't just slowly follow something. Instead, they jump back and forth between objects. That's called nystagmus. It's a normal eye movement if we're using it functionally. You know, driving down the road, we're looking at something and our eye is trying to catch the road sign and the um, speed limit and all the things that we need to look at, but if it's happening at rest, then it is an abnormal eye movement. That's nystagmus. Tinnitus is ringing in the ears, and it's also a symptom. It helps uh, specialists um, differentiate between different disorders and what the cause of the vertigo is. Tinnitus and nystagmus both, whether it's present or absent. All right, our balance centers we already talked about. Inner ear anatomy. Um, so our semicircular canals that we spoke of are here. Our cochlea is here. And then the vestibular nerve um, is one of your cranial nerves and gives you that input from your inner ear to tell you where everything is and how your head is moving. Here is our roadmap of what we're going to cover. So we're going to cover BPPV, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, vestibular neuritis, chronic vestibular loss, and Meniere's disease. There's a lot more 
vestibular disorders out there, but these are just kind of the basic, most common vestibular disorders so that we can just get an idea of what's going on with those. With BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, this is that dizziness, that vertigo, uh, dizzy spinning sensation with head movements. Typically, patients will complain that it feels like a spinning sensation, and most often they feel it when they either roll over in bed or they sit up from a supine position. Um, the cause of BPPV is those crystals, those otoconia or the canalith inside of the ear becoming displaced. They have now dislodged from the gel that they were sitting on and they're loose within the ear. Now, where they are in the ear determines how you treat it. They could be in the semicircular canals. They could be other places as well. Um, but the most common is for them to be in one of the semicircular canals. That's called canalolisthesis. If it's in a different portion of the inner ear, the cupula, then it would be cupulolisthesis. Um, and that would require a different positioning maneuver. Um, this does cause significant dizziness. The dizziness should not last more than a minute. If it's true BPPV, the dizziness should go away within a minute. If the dizziness lasts longer, then um, you're looking at some other diagnosis to figure out what exactly is causing their dizziness. Um, in many patients, the dizziness is so intense that they end up becoming nauseous or um, vomiting. And so just be very careful because some of the positions you do to treat it could provoke those symptoms as well. Um, some of the things that cause BPV, BPPV, a true cause is not known, but um, they, they often relate it to a recent virus or recent trauma. So we're not sure exactly why the crystals become misplaced or dislodged and placed somewhere else in the ear, but oftentimes people who have BPPV have either had a recent virus or a recent trauma, like a car accident or a fall, something like that. All right, and there are some videos. Um, these pictures right here are actual videos. So I will try and put those in the play pause it links for you to look at. Oh, it's gonna play the videos. Okay. All right, so causes of BPPV. I talked about the crystals in your ear becoming um, dislodged, but I wanted you to also see a picture. So, um, these are the crystals, and if they're dislodged over in the um, semicircular canals, this would be um, canalolisthesis, like I was talking about, and it will cause normal head movements to provoke dizziness. Why? Well, with normal head movements, let's say if they're in the right place, you move, the fluid and the hair cells go in the opposite direction and tell your brain, hey, I moved this far this at this speed and you get that signal well when there's little crystals in that part of the ear as you move the hair cells are pushed dramatically in a different direction every movement causes a big change in the movement of the hair cells so since the hair cell movement is what tells you exactly what um, is going on then your brain gets a signal as if you are spinning, kind of like being on a roller coaster. Okay, I'm sorry about that. My phone was ringing and I couldn't figure out how to pause it, so I'm very sorry. Um, okay, so we were talking about the crystals in the ear getting dislodged and causing your brain to feel like you're spinning. Most people will say it feels kind of similar to being on a roller coaster, so just normal head movements will make them feel like they're on a roller coaster. So some people will actually throw up, just like the, some people will throw up when they ride a roller coaster. Um, let me just go back and see if there was anything else I need to cover on that one slide. No. Okay. Um, Dick's Hall Pike, that is actually a special test that we do in order to determine if the patient has BPPV and to determine which canal the canalith is positioned in. So based on where it has move to, there's different positions we use to reposition it. Um, so 
when we do this test, we have them turn their head and quickly lay back with their head extended over the table. And then we watch their eye movements. You have to tell them, keep your eyes open while I'm doing this and you watch their eye movements. And depending on which way the nystagmus goes, tells you which canal is affected. Um, so the eye movements are key. So tell them to keep their eyes open the whole time and also ask kind of how they feel the whole time. If the nystagmus and the symptoms last for more than a minute, remember this is not BPPV. There's something else causing their symptoms. And there's a ton of causes of vertigo, vestibular disorders. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I would highly recommend taking vestibular continuing education courses. All right, vestibular neuritis is just inflammation of the vestibular nerve itself. It can happen with a virus. Herpes is one of the more common viruses that can lead to um, vestibular neuritis since it lays dormant in your system. Um, and it's a cause of sudden onset of vestibular dysfunction. So all of a sudden they feel dizziness, balance disorders, all of that. Some of the symptoms are dizziness, vertigo, balance deficits, and then there can also be changes in hearing and or vision related to vestibular neuritis. Uh, Anti-inflammatories can help that condition. Typically, PT is not um, called for while they actually are in an active episode, but afterwards, if they have continued balance deficits, then physical therapy may be possible for people with vestibular neuritis. Chronic vestibular loss. So it's also known as vestibular hypofunction. Um, and it's a slow onset of unsteadiness, loss of balance. It can be worse in poor lighting because remember the three sensory, um, three balance centers, one of them is vision. So um, if you don't have the vestibular system and now the vision is taken out, uh, your balance gets significantly worse. It's also worse on uneven uh, surfaces. Same thing, proprioception is removed, and that's what you were relying on. And um, it can get worse with quick head turns. Symptoms can also include fatigue, decreased vestibular or visual ocular reflex. Visual ocular reflex we'll learn about a few slides down, and a history of vertigo. Um, they typically name it by unilateral or bilateral based on if it's one side or both. Um, and so unilateral vestibular loss, UVL, is a common diagnosis. You'll see it abbreviated UVL. Um, it's not normal just to, over time as you age, have the significant of uh, balance and dizziness and issues. Um, so if somebody comes in with the mindset of this is just normal aging, uh, it's not, and hopefully you can help them with vestibular therapy. Meniere's disease, this is a chronic um, vestibular disorder. It's characterized by episodes where they have fullness of the ear and then hearing loss, vertigo, and tinnitus, that ringing in the ear. So what happens is the um, endolymphatic uh, sac is full of fluid. It becomes full of fluid. And so they start to feel this fullness in their ear, this fluid in their ear, it gets more and more significant. And eventually it busts and busts the tympanic membrane. And so immediately they lose their hearing. They are completely off balance and um, they have ringing in their ears. And then over time, the tympanic membrane regenerates and heals itself. Um, the problem is, as it heals itself, scar tissue also develops, and scar tissue makes the um, membrane um, less pliable, and so then it's not reacting to sound waves as easily. Think about a drum that now has a hard piece of glued together in the middle. It's not going to make the same sound, and so over time, they have more and more lasting hearing loss. As they have more and more episodes, the hearing loss um, becomes, even though they go from full hearing loss and then it regenerates, they able to hear some, uh, it's diminished each time that they have an episode because of the scar tissue that develops. Um, during an episode, it may be so intense and their dizziness so intense that they may vomit. 
Uh, they may even be unable to coordinate their movements in order to walk without assistance. Um, and as the disease progresses, unfortunately, they have more and more episodes and it can become more and more debilitating. Um, I had a friend with Meniere's disease and she was pretty young and she was very healthy and loved outdoorsy stuff. She got to the point where she would not leave her house for a while because every time she would leave, she would have such a significant episode that she would either vomit or she would have to sit down. There was times she'd be grocery shopping and she'd have to just sit down. She couldn't walk or she, she puked in the grocery store and was super embarrassed. And so there are some different treatment options. Um, let me go over the presentation again really quickly and I'll go over the treatment options. Dizziness, loss of balance, vomiting, blurred vision, nystagmus, and then the balance is worse with the eyes closed. Um, but some of the treatments, so if they do have that severe of a case and it is debilitating, they can put shots um, directly to the area or do a, I think it's a dehiscence where they kind of go in and cut the vestibular nerve. But the problem is um, when they do these procedures, it may take away the symptoms, but it also, it damages the vestibular nerve. So then it causes some symptoms, dizziness and balance issues. It also could um, cause hearing loss, full or partial hearing loss. So they may say, this is so debilitating, I need something done. But afterwards, they may still have symptoms and now they may be deaf. So whether or not it was worth it to them, you know, the patient just has to decide beforehand if they're willing to take that risk. Um, my friend did have the shots and they did cause some more hearing loss. They helped a little bit. They helped the episodes come a little less frequently, maybe a little less intense, but she was highly, highly disappointed with her results um, because she was hoping that they would take them away altogether. And, and for some people they do. Um, so with physical therapy, it does not help the disease itself. It doesn't change uh, Meniere's disease. It doesn't keep it from getting worse. But what it can help is the balance deficits that the person's left with after episodes. So if they now are at a higher fall risk and they're off balance, they're having difficulty walking, any of that, then they can do physical therapy and um, get some help with those symptoms. Um, but the disease itself is not going to change based on it. Okay, and then the disease will sometimes start on one side and progress to the other side, but not always. So just because they have it on one side doesn't mean they'll have it on both. All right, um, just in general for vestibular disorders, um, the differential diagnosis, how do we determine what disorder it is? Because like I said, there are a ton of vestibular disorders that have very similar symptoms, nausea, dizziness, maybe even headache. Um, so we ask a lot of questions and get uh, a better idea of their symptoms. So was your symptom onset sudden or gradual? How long have you had symptoms and how long do the symptoms last? What provokes the symptoms? Do you have headaches or neck pain while you have symptoms? Is that a provoking factor? What is the family history? And then what medications are you on? What illness do you have? One medication um, that is often prescribed for dizziness, um, it's, I've lost the name of it for a second. I'll come up with it and I'll put it in the play closet. <laughs> um, but one that I know of that, um, not just I know of, that's commonly prescribed for dizziness, um, the way that it helps with dizziness is actually by paralyzing the hair cells in the inner ear. And um, as it paralyzes them, then you, you no longer feel um, the symptoms. You don't feel dizzy, you don't feel spinning, and so it helps, so people like it. The problem is, if you take that medicine for more than three days straight, then it can cause that paralysis to become permanent. So it could permanently, um, damage or paralyze the hair cells in your ear. And so um, the big issue with that is then it basically creates a new issue. Now you no longer have vertigo, but you have vestibular hypofunction or vestibular loss. 
um, because now you're getting no input on that side. So your brain is really not sure what's going on with your head over there. Um, so uh, vancomycin, I think I'll put it, I'll put it in there. Um, vancomycin. Anyway, it's, it's a common, and I know when I was taking the vestibular course, they were saying a lot of doctors weren't necessarily educated on that side effect of the drug. And so, um, most of the, um, patients that I had that were on that medication, uh, had not been told that by the doctor. They just said, if you're dizzy, take it. And then they saw it help. So they just kept taking it. I had patients that had been on it for years. Um, but most of them were not told that it could actually cause permanent balance issues if you take it uh, more than three days straight. So just something to keep in mind and educate your patients on or your family members, anybody that you know, if they're um, prescribed any type of medication for vertigo. Um, the main three um, types of clinicians that will diagnose vestibular disorders are an ear, nose, and throat specialist, a neurologist, and actually a physical therapist, depending on um, if they are referred to them or not. And um, all three of those disciplines um, can take the same vestibular rehab therapist course. So the one that I took to get certified, um, there were ENTs and neurologists in that same course. Um, so that is kind of the common way of learning about vestibular disorders. All right, so treatment. What can we do for treatment for someone who has vestibular dysfunction? We can do canalith repositioning, balance training, vestibular ocular reflex training, visual tracking exercises, saccade training, and desensitization training. We'll go into each of those specifically now. Canalith repositioning. So the Epley maneuver basically starts out like the Dick's Hall Pike. You start in the same position and then you do other head movements that basically use gravity to pull the cantilever that's out of place back down into the gel substance that it's supposed to be on. So you have you first use the Dick's Hall Pike to determine where do I think the cantilever is. The Epley's maneuver is good for repositioning um, when the cantilith has fallen into either the anterior or posterior semicircular canals. If it's the horizontal, then there's a different position, uh, I mean, a different positioning maneuver, the barbecue roll, we like to call it. Um, there's others as well. There's others for, for all of the semicircular canals that you can use. And then if it is not in the cantilith, in the um, semicircular canals, if it's in the cupula, the cupula listhesis, there are other positioning maneuvers as well. The good thing is um, the Epley's maneuver actually can typically help with about 90% of true BPPP, <laughs> BPPP um, patients because most of them do have it dislodged in either the anterior or posterior canal. So if you know this one, then you can help most of your vestibular um, patients who have BPPV. And then if you are interested, then you would need to know um, quite a few other ones to be able to have the toolbox for all the different scenarios. Um, so you place the patients head in different positions. I'll show you the video on what those positions look like. I think I said all this. You monitor their eye movements and you monitor their symptoms throughout. You hold each position 30 seconds to a minute. Um, typically, ideally, you have them in that position. They tell you when their symptoms go away and then you wait an additional 30 seconds. But if their symptoms haven't went away within a minute, you can go ahead and change positions, go to the next position because remember, true BPPV, the symptoms don't last more than a minute in each head position or each provoking factor. Sometimes maybe their um, initial symptom was um, spinning or dizziness and that may go away, but like they're still nauseous. So that still would mean that the symptoms went away within a minute. It just kind of had some residual effects. So you hold each position and then when they sit up, be very careful 
A lot of people feel like they're falling when they sit up and they will actually jerk backwards. So you have to really guard them when they sit up because that is the point where the cantilift actually falls down to where it's supposed to be. So it feels like a big jerky movement to them. And oftentimes their body reflexively jerks backwards. So if you're not guarding them properly, they may fall. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that sometimes this this provokes their symptoms. So it may make them so dizzy that they throw up. So I um, had my own vestibular clinic for just like a year before I moved being pregnant with number three. And um, so I did it often. I did this this repositioning often, and I've done it a lot in other settings as well, but um, in that amount of time, I always had the trash can close by, and I only had one person that um, really came close to throwing up. I mean, several felt like they were going to throw up, but they weren't like gagging over the trash can. I only had one I can think of that was really sick while we did it, um, so keep a trash can nearby for sure. Um, if you don't have specialized equipment. So sometimes it's hard to tell what canal it's in. Um, be, ideally, they would be wearing these goggles that block out their vision so they can't stabilize their gaze. So sometimes, even if they're having nystagmus, they can kind of override it by staring at something and it will make it look less intense or be less obvious what kind of nystagmus they have. Um, so if you're having trouble deciding which canal it's in, um, if you have that technology, then put the goggles on and record it so you can watch it over and over and decide. But if you don't, then what you can do, worst case scenario, is figure out which side they have more symptoms on. So you turn them to the left, do the dig saw pike, sit them up, wait. Um, how long? A minute. Sorry, I, I thought I had it below. A minute. Wait one minute, um, at least one minute, and then do it again on the opposite side. And if they have more significant symptoms when their head is turned one side versus the other, that's the side that you start towards when you do the epilepsy. Um, now, if if you can see the eye movements, name it by that. That's the gold standard. But if you cannot and you can't figure out then you can try that. I have, um, this is not the way to do it, but I have in the past done it on one side and it didn't help. And then I tried it on the other side and it did. So that's very worst case scenario. If you think you know the side and you try it and they're like, I'm just as dizzy as I was before, um, then you could possibly try on the other side. Typically, I won't do it in the same treatment. I'll do it one treatment and then they'll have to come back another day and I'll try the other side. Um, you can actually give them the Epley's maneuver to do as a home exercise program. It's, sometimes it doesn't fall into place the first time. Sometimes they have to do it, um, you know, once a day or something for a few days before it actually fully uh, removes their symptoms. Um, typically what we tell the patient after they have had the repositioning maneuver is do not lay down flat for the next, uh, for at least... You can tell it's been a minute since I practiced. This is like common knowledge for me. For at least two hours. Yeah. I can't find it on my slide. So, um, again, if it's not two hours, I'll, I'll verify with the play pause and I'm sorry. But um, you do tell them don't lay down flat for at least two hours. And um, because if the cantilith is now in the right place, you don't want to risk possibly dislodging it to somewhere else. All right. Okay, I've said all those things. We're ready to move on. All right, so balance training. Um, so we have went over this several times, so you guys should be pretty good on balance training at this point, but you know that we can do balance on various surfaces. They can have their eyes open or closed. They can put their feet in various positions, can stand, um, on various surfaces. Okay. 
there's that again. <laughs> and um, you can teach them balance strategies like weight shift strategy, strategy shifting their weight back and forth or forward and backwards. Um, you could practice with perturbations. You push them gently in different directions and then they have to react and hold themselves up. Um, so there's a wide variety of things you can do for ba balance training. You guys are pretty familiar with those, but we'll practice them again in lab. Um, one thing I want to mention about gait belts, of course, it's the gold standard to always have somebody in a gait belt when you're doing balance training. If they're at a fall risk, which they typically are if you're doing balance training, um, the problem is sometimes it becomes kind of like a security blanket that when the gait belt's on, they feel like they can do anything. You take it off and they feel like they can't do anything. So the things that they're able to do at therapy are not really rolling over and carrying over to their actual functional environment because they feel just as scared at home as they always have. Um, and then you put the gate belt on and they feel now somebody will catch me. I'm not scared of falling. Um, so typically I'll start out with the gate belt on and then as I progress the patient and as they get close to discharge, I'll start weaning them off the gate belt and try to do very more challenging things without the gate belt on and still, um, you know, kind of prove to them that they can. And then another thing that I've shared with you all before, I believe, but that I've found helpful is if you do have patients that are pretty unsteady, have them do their balance exercises in a corner. So their back is to the corner. And if they fall back, then the wall is catching them. And if they fall forward, you're standing there to catch them. So they stand, if they're standing on foam with their eyes closed or something, they are all the way back towards the corner, not leaning on it, because then that would be cheating. Um, but so that if they start to lose balance in those directions, the wall has them. And if they go forward, you have them. Um, I typically do not give balance exercises for a home exercise program because uh, it's just really too much uh, risk involved. They could fall and hurt themselves and I just typically don't do that. Um, you can do like sitting balance with their eyes open and closed and leaning side to side and marching and things like that. Um, you could do gait training that, you know, have them practice, you know, make sure you walk more, make sure you um, try and walk outside some today, or, you know, if there's something like that, that you feel comfortable that they're steady enough to do, uh, without you there as part of their home exercise program. But I typically don't give fall risk patients any balance training to do while I'm not there, more just like leg strengthening, um, and things like that. One thing you can give them to do in their home exercise program, though, is the VOR, vestibular so I called it a visual ocular reflex, uh, but it's vestibular ocular reflex um, training, BOR training, vestibular ocular reflex. So um, this is the reflex that helps a patient stabilize their gaze while their head is moving. So I can look and everything be clear and I can move my head and still keep focus on the same thing. Uh, that is the VOR, vestibular ocular reflex, that is allowing me to do that. If I start to move and things become blurry or double or any of that, it's going to throw my balance off because um, my brain is saying, you know, you're moving too fast or things are spinning. And so training this uh, reflex and getting it stronger is key in allowing the patient to do their normal head moves without stimulating dizziness and loss of balance. So... Um, you're trying to decrease the amount of blurred vision and also dizziness with head movements. So the first way we typically have somebody do it is they stare at their thumb and they shake their head either no or they can shake it yes. Typically we start with no as fast as they can without their thumb becoming blurry. If their thumb is blurry, they need to slow down a little bit. But if it's not, they need to speed up as fast as they can without it being blurry. Um, that is the VOR training. Typically, you have them do it for 30 seconds to a minute. They may do it several times a day as part of their home exercise program. And over time, they're able to stabilize their eyes as their head moves without things becoming blurry. VOR cancellation is actually um, 
when you are able to move with an object and keep your focus on that object without it becoming blurry. So ideally, I have them sit like in an office chair or something, and they still hold their thumb out, and they stare at their thumb, and their whole body moves as a unit. So um, some being on a surface that rotates is ideal, and they just go back and forth as quickly as they can without that object getting the thumb, in this case, getting blurred. Um, so the whole body, the thumb, and the eyes move as a unit. So it works on allowing them to keep their eyes fixed in the center of their eye sockets as their head moves around um, their eyes. So keeping their gaze fixed as their head moves. So here their eyes are fixed and their head's moving around the socket. And then with the VR cancellation, everything is fixed in place so that as you move, um, the eyes are going with the head. Okay, and, and it would be done the same way, um, given for like 30 seconds to a minute. And uh, if you progress them, you could progress how many times they do it. So you do it for 30 seconds, but now let's repeat it three times. You could progress the speed at which they do it. You could also progress the distance. So you could write like the letter B, um, like a closed letter or the number eight. Those types of things are best to look at on a post-it note and put it a little bit further away than what their thumb would be. And they stare at that and move. You could progress by changing the background, making it a really busy background rather than just the plain surface. Um, let's see. You can also progress how much time they spend doing it, um, how many times they repeat it. Typically, it's about three to five. Oh, and then you can put them in different positions. So you may have them start out doing it in seated so that they're safe and you can have it as part of their home exercise program. Um, but then you may progress to them doing it in standing. They could even stand on various surfaces um, and they could even do it while they are walking or changing positions to make it a little bit more challenging. All right, with visual tracking exercises, you instruct the patient to stare at an object while it's moving within their visual field. So you've probably seen that happen at the doctor's office. They say, look at my finger or look at the end of this pen. And then they go side to side and up and down and diagonal and you are watching the whole time. So it's checking for your smooth pursuit eye movements. It should, the, the therapist should be going slow enough that the patient can smoothly with their eyes follow the movement. If the patient's eyes start jumping and the therapist is going slow enough, then that signifies a problem that they're having saccadic eye movements, jumpy eye movements instead of smooth pursuit when they're trying to watch something slowly move. Now, if you find them doing jumpy, my first recommendation is slow down and then see if it's still jumpy. Um, you may just be moving too fast. But as they get better and their eyes get stronger, then you can change the speed of the movement, make it a little bit faster. You can change the size of the object. You can add head movements while they're pursuing an object and you can change the patient's position. Also getting them in standing or having them walk. Um, a couple of recommendations. I, you do not go outside of their visual field. So when you watch the video, you may notice, uh, I personally think she's going a little bit fast and going a little bit too far. Um, you want to stop before the patient's eyes meet the very edge of their, um, um, you know, word finding has been an issue for me lately. Eye socket. <laughs> Should be easy enough. Um, so you want to stop the object's movement before the eyes meet the edge of their eye socket. Otherwise, you're going too far in their peripheral vision. So it should be directly in front of them. Um, and again, you can check horizontal, vertical, and uh, diagonal movements. Okay, so saccade training. So saccades are those jumpy eye movements. They are normal when you are trying to quickly look from one thing to another. So if I'm looking back and forth between the edges of my computer screen, then uh, my eyes should be doing jumpy movements. Smooth pursuit would not be fast enough. But if they're happening at rest, 
they're not ideal. So you can train your eyes to be able to jump quickly so that as you're walking, if you need to quickly see this sign or see this room number or something, your eye can jump to that and uh, give you this significant or your sufficient input for what you need. Um, how we train that is you hold two objects, typically again around um, arm's length away. You can hold them as the therapist or they can hold them themselves and they keep their head still and jump their eyes back and forth between the objects. Now, if you're going to move the object, make sure their eye is on the other object before you move. Uh, you don't want to constantly be moving things because then they are combining smooth pursuit with saccades and it's just all messy. So keep your arms still and then they jump their eyes back and forth. Um, another way that you can do it is doing corrective saccades, which mean that they, if I say look up here, they look up and then they turn their head so that their eyes are in the middle of their eye socket and then they look at the other and then they turn their heads towards the other and my arm should really be a little bit closer. So I would look up, turn my head, look down, turn my head and up, turn my head, down, turn my head and they repeat that. Now both of these can be done the same way, 30 seconds to a minute. You can um, progress by changing the speed um, of the movement or the distance, how far away the objects are um the position that um patient is in things like that to make it just a little bit more difficult um okay and then desensitization training so the term if you don't use it you lose it definitely applies to vestibular therapy therapy you may not have known that but um you have to challenge your vestibular system to keep it strong and so if you're not challenging it, maybe you're walking slowly or you're not walking a lot, you're in bed a lot, um, you know, and you're really cautious about your movements when you get up over time, it becomes weaker and weaker. And so then when the system is less strong, it's also less effective and not sure how to um, handle whatever input's coming in. So for example, if you've been doing bicep curls on a consistent basis, for years and then you go and you help somebody move and you're doing a lot of bicep work picking boxes up then you may not be sore afterwards but if you stop doing those exercises and it's been a while since you've picked anything heavy up and then all of a sudden you help somebody move your body is going to be overly sore <laughs> because of that um that little bit of exercise or demand that you put on it so what will happen in the elderly population is they get scared. They get scared of falling. So they start to walk in this stiff way and try not to move their head very much because they're scared of falling. Other things that happen is they move their head and they get dizzy. Well, then they don't want to get dizzy because they're scared of falling. So they keep their head really still to avoid the dizziness. The problem is the more still their head is, the less input the vestibular system is getting. So it becomes weaker. As it gets weaker, Every little head movement causes more dizziness. So the dizziness actually gets worse with smaller movements. And so then they move it even less and it just, the cycle repeats. They stop moving their head because of the dizziness, then any little head movement provokes the dizziness. And it's a vicious cycle that causes um, vestibular issues. So desensitization training is you're using those head movements. So you can use swinging, swaying, you know, being pushed, spinning, any any type of um, head movement, and you try to get them to the point of dizziness and then let them settle. So basically, kind of like you're building a muscle, you get it to the point of fatigue in order to make it stronger. So you get them to the point where dizziness is starting, and then the next time you try and push them a little bit further, and hopefully dizziness starts a little bit later, and you push, push, push until they're able to return to normal head movements without that dizziness. Um, so desensitization is decreasing their response to the head movements. Um, so normal head movements should not provoke dizziness. And if they do, desensitization would be a good way of stopping that. So I had a patient once that started getting, he had such problems with dizziness, he started getting to where he would not even ride in a car. So it kind of left him homebound. And we started doing, I would spin him around in an office chair and I would push him real fast and so he hated it. <laughs> um, I even 
would get him. It was an adult, um, but I would put him on um, like a vestibular swing, have him put, sit on the swing, and I would push him back and forth and all this. And over time, he got every treatment. I would try and increase how long I did it. So first time I might have done 10 spins, and the next time I tried to do 12 spins, or first time I pushed him for two minutes and the next time I tried to push him for three minutes you know I would try and increase the length of time to where it got to a point where it didn't bother him at all and he you know thank the Lord he was able to start riding in a car again without any issues and even to the point where he was able to get on a plane he had been scared of a beginning on a plane his whole life and he uh, was able to get on a plane and go to Disney World without any issues so it really does help but it may take some time to get them used to the input Okay, these are some videos on um, vestibular um, therapy, and I can leave those video links in the play closet, um, just, you know, in case that would be helpful for you. That is all we have for today on vestibular disorders. Please let me know if you have questions, and I will see you in lab.